Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel, comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. Simon Says, The John Simon Thriller, Book One by Brian Thomas Schmidt. Master Detective John Simon is a tough, streetwise 17-year veteran of the Kansas City Police Department with a healthy disdain for the encroachment of modern technology into his workplace. When his partner is kidnapped after a routine stakeout by thugs with seeming ties to connected, wealthy art dealer Benjamin Ashman, he's determined to find the truth. But the only witness is a humanoid android named Lucas George. Reluctantly, he takes Lucas along as he begins to investigate and soon finds himself depending more and more on the very technology he so distrusts. Meanwhile, Simon's precocious teenage daughter begins to teach Lucas how to sound more like a cop using dialogue from famous cop movies. If only he'd use them in the appropriate context. This exciting new mix of near-future science fiction and procedural thriller captures the gritty realism of Michael Connelly's Bosch, the humor and action of Lethal Weapon, and follows the classic science fiction tradition of Isaac Asimov's City of Steel. From the editor of the international best-selling phenomenon The Martian by Andy Weir and the national best-selling author of tales including official entries in The X-Files, Predator, and the Joe Ledger thrillers comes the action-packed first entry in an exciting new series. Be sure to pick up Simon Says by Brian Thomas Schmidt and get into the series on the ground floor. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure a bloodhound with a terrifying past who'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi. A cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic. Delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. 
survivor, mother, leader, and humanity's last chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jared Beasley on the show with me today. He has a fantastic new book. It's called In Search of Al Howie, and what an incredible story. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jared. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Jared, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, I will take that in two parts. Uh, okay. First memory of wanting to be a storyteller would be one of my first memories uh, growing up in northern Alabama. It, it seemed like everybody in my family was a storyteller, so I I really wanted to be like them. My grandmother was perhaps the best. She had taught school for 50 years in a one-room schoolhouse, and uh, she was famous for getting off subject. <laughs> the students <laughs> loved her, <laughs> and uh, she used to just tell the best stories, and I wanted to be just like her. As far as being a writer, um, I had kind of gone around through several different mediums of storytelling from being an actor and uh, then directing some uh, pictures and then finally to writing. And that didn't really come about until about 2010. I was doing a blog and uh, I went back and finished my degree and finished that up in 2013. And that whole experience there of going back. Uh, I got into several authors and uh, that was a really definitive moment when I knew I wanted to, to okay, writing is what I want to do. And and all of this prologue has been, uh, you know, time <laughs> to suck up all these stories and now it's time to produce. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Jared, I've had uh, quite a few either Southern writers or writers with Southern heritage and that uh, that topic comes up a lot about kind of the innate storytelling that comes from Southern life. Um, and I like to get people's opinion on that. What do you think it is about growing up in the South or, or being in that atmosphere that breeds so many storytellers? I think one aspect of it is, I mean, when, when I'm thinking about my grandmother, is there really wasn't a lot else to do. Right. It was, you know, she lived out in the middle of nowhere. There were no traffic lights even today. And um, that's just the way that they entertained themselves. That's the way they kept their family history alive. It's the way they kept people alive, people that they loved, you know, who were who had passed on. It was all through stories, and um, it was just a crucial part of um, our day-to-day lives. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there's, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is um, that I, I've met people from, uh, say, the Northeast, and uh, they have similar, you know, storytelling cultures. Uh, theirs uh, may not take place on the front porch like a lot of ours do. Maybe theirs is, uh, you know, gathered around a fishing dock or uh, but there's something just about people that gather with shared experience, and it's it's kind of a I think it's more of a human thing than a regional thing. It just seems to 
to manifest more in certain regions. It, it does. Um, it does. And I, I think that also that <laughs> I, I don't know that region wise, it, it, I, I do believe that it's um, uh, a universal quality, and uh, especially with people that are, um, let's say, in the more rural parts of the world, uh, storytelling is such an oral culture, is such a, a really big, big thing. It, it, for me, growing up in North Alabama and then having lived now over 20 years in New York, I've met a lot of interesting people in New York, a lot of crazy characters, uh, and actually a couple of them are in this book. But um, the stories that, that kind of came into my life when I was a boy in Alabama, I, I will never forget. And those are ones that uh, are still on my list to get to to write about. And the, they were just so unusual, just things that come into your life, uh, just so bizarre. Yeah, the, 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 one of the first things that I think about is uh, this incident that happened in the 80s. Uh, so the, in, I was, I'm from Decatur, and then it was a town of about 50,000 people. But my families, they were all from outside of Decatur. They're from about 20 miles away. And you can get into the, the sticks really quick. And that's where my grandparents are from on both sides. And um, anyway, the, in the 80s, this man went missing. His name was Derek Kachera. He was like 23 years old, and he had played football. He was kind of a local football star. He went missing, and the, the he was in, last seen in a vehicle uh, with another male driving with blonde hair. And he had left his keys, left his wallet, left all his valuables, everything in the home. And uh, the only person that had been at the home that night was his brother. And his brother had said that he had gone out and gone to the store, and when he came back, you know, Derek was gone. Um, I was only about 12 years old when this happened, but my mother knew this family, and for some reason, my mother decided to take him into our home, the brother, um, who was a suspect in the disappearance of this man, Derek Chera, and he lived with us for a month, and he was the kindest person to me. He was like a big brother. He would uh, spend time with me. He was gentle. He would talk with me. He seemed to really care about me. And then he started having these schizophrenic bouts. Um, he believed that the Russians were trying to kind of hack into his head, and he was studying the encyclopedia every day to build this helmet, you know, and then it's, it's unbelievable. And then he left, and he wound up in a mental home, you know, the rest of his life. They never solved that. But as an adult, I look back at that and I, I ask myself, why did my mother let this person into our home? You know, as a, as a, you know, someone who I don't have a child, but if I did, I certainly wouldn't, I would never do that. But as someone who wants to write stories, interested, interesting, you know, and interested in, in stories, I'm so glad that that did happen to me, <laughs> right. that I had that experience, you know, and there was just so much of that uh, yeah. in Alabama. There was just so much eccentricity there. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we all love a great mystery, too. I'd love to see what you do with that story and some other stories from, from North Alabama. That would be fantastic. Yeah, there, there are quite a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite a few. You said a few minutes ago that when you decided to pursue writing, you had this uh, epiphany, my word, um, that uh, you know the things that you had been doing all along were now kind of the prologue to, to what your mission would be. Um, what had you been doing? Uh, what, was, uh, what career path had you taken? I had done a bit of everything uh, when it comes to storytelling. When I was in college, I was an actor. Um, I was studying to be an actor. I was acting in plays all the time. I was a DJ in Tuscaloosa for two years on a country music station. Um, and then when I came to New York, I was acting. Then I was working uh, in the theaters as a bar manager. So I was always around uh, the shows and uh, would kick it backstage a lot of times and, and experienced and saw some amazing stories um, there. I, I then was an usher 
at Lincoln Center, you know, and and so every night you got to you didn't make a lot of money, but you you got to listen to some of the greatest music in the world. That's true. And um, then I got into tutoring. I'd picked up Japanese after coming to the city. Uh, As my wife one is does. Japanese. As one does, right? Yeah, why not? Um, and so I, I wound up starting my own tutoring service, and uh, I would tutor Japanese business people who were coming to America uh, and they needed English. And uh, that branched out into about like 25 students a week, you know, hour and a half each class. And that lasted for many, many, many years. And I found myself again, I, I was not trained as an English teacher. So I was interested in their stories and what they had to say. And then I needed to create some lessons. So I took the old in search of TV show. Do you remember that with Leonard Nimoy? He oh, narrated yeah. those, those mysteries, you know, and I, and they were perfect lessons. I would break them up into three parts. I made vocabulary sheets. And so every day I, I, I turned our classes into stories. And uh, so it, all of that really kind of crescendoed into a blog that I was writing for Japanese people. And I was trying to teach them about American culture. That was the goal of it. And I had a movie week. Every Friday was a movie. And it, I felt so fortunate to be able to tell people about it's a wonderful life, you know, or something like that. And they had never heard of that or what this meant or who Jimmy Stewart was. Um, so it was such a privilege. And uh, the blog and the teaching led to uh, an extraordinary event, which is that I was teaching uh, this one student and he had been with me for five years and he was about to go back to Japan and he had, he knew that I had never finished my degree and he asked me uh, how much I had left I said ah, it's like a semester but because of the way that they you know the whole way that the college situation works it would probably take me a year he said how much is that and I said I don't know it'd probably be eleven thousand dollars or something like that and he said well um, just let me know and uh, I'll take care of that and yeah, yeah. And those moments, you know, really, you better listen to those because if you don't, you're, you're really going to miss a, a path. And um, so I took it and I went back to school. And it was then that I really got into Melville a lot. I got really obsessed with Melville. Um, I'm an obsessive person anyway. But when I went back and had to take so many literature classes, to uh, finish my degree, I wound up doing kind of my, uh, I, I did a correspondence course with the head of the literature department there, and it was only on Melville. And so I wound up hiking to a mountain up in Massachusetts where he met Hawthorne for the first time, and they were in a cave, and uh, the transformation that happened in his writing, and how Moby Dick then became a second book after that meeting. And I just became enthralled with writing, and I, try, I started taking the blog and and uh, stopped doing that, actually, and uh, writing short stories and things like that, and screenplays. And it was a very humbling time. And um, then that turned into narrative nonfiction uh, through course of events that were beyond my control. I love it. Um uh, I, I really miss uh, blogging as as kind of a cultural thing. Um, so many great um, writers have have cut their teeth um, there, you know, found an audience, you know, built great communities. And, and I, I really lament that social media is is kind of killing off that platform uh, in a lot of ways. That's that's neither here nor there. That's just a, an observation. But I, I love that. So you, true. Yeah, I, I love that you really found your way there. Um, that's amazing. Um, it, it sounds to me like you are the kind of person that um, sees a person and sees their story behind them. I mean, from from Melville to the other um, you know works that you've written and people that you followed and and tried to uncover their 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 story. Uh, and that's one thing I'm fascinated with too. It's one reason I do this podcast is I, I really want to see what makes people tick and, you know, where, where does creativity come from? Uh, do you think like that? Uh, is it, or is it, is it something that you recognize, 
um, as you know, the kind of writer that you are, the things that you are interested in and obsessed with? I've come to realize that. Um, I, I don't think that I knew that as a young man. And I don't think I, I knew that as a young adult. I think it's only been through writing that I've really started. And, and then when the, you know, I did a book and then this second book and I'm working on a third book that I, I've come to, to realize that about myself, that, um, that for me, if, if it's not something that, uh, that is a story that can be passed on or that can have deeper meanings for people or that can affect people's lives or impact people, then I don't have a lot of time for it because it just seems so ephemeral. Uh, I mean, I, I, of course, I follow politics. Uh, I follow technology, the things that are going on. How can you not? Um, but those things change so fast. And, uh, and of course, in this political environment now, I've got so many friends that they, they're just totally swallowed by it every day. And, and, I, and I ask them, I say, if you were to go back in some kind of time machine, 2,000 years, and you could be around you know, uh, the ancient Romans or the ancient Greeks or any culture, you know, what would you do? Would you choose to get involved with the politics of the day to see what they were passing or who was leading or, or what the, corrupt, you know, the corruption that was going on at that time was? Not, not that it's not important now. It very much is. But what would you do? Or would you try to follow uh, a Plato around or a Socrates, you know, uh, Aristotle or one of these great writers or thinkers? You know, how would you spend your time? And I feel that uh, that way about my life. I, I remind myself that that's really what I've realized about myself, that that's what I'm about. There are plenty of other people that are more educated, more qualified to write about uh, the politics and the the changes that are going on so fast right now uh, with our technology. But uh, for me, uh, I'm uh, from a different salt. I'm 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 somebody that that is really just ground in these stories and and something that maybe hopefully can mean something. With not whether it's my writing or not, but just the stories that touch me are, are the ones that are still true today as they were 2,000 years ago, something that we can relate to, something that's eternal or part of the human experience. I, I agree with you. There, there just seems to be some things that are more solid uh, than others, and all of the the uh, the back and forth of the, the daily political fights just seems ephemeral in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it, it does. And, and they are important. Uh, I don't want to diminish that. It's just everybody has their role. And, um, and, it, and it took me a long time to try to find mine. And uh, I, I remember the head of my department, maybe the, the best advice he ever gave me was that life was not a race. And uh, I'm so glad that he told me that and that I listened to that. And I try to remind myself of that when the birthdays come. <laughs> you know. Right. Well, um, let, let's talk a little bit about this new book uh, that you've got out in uh, in search of Al Howie. Um, who is Al, and and how did you discover this really eccentric guy? Well, Al Howie is an outlier as a runner. He was a runner, uh, and also he was an outlier as a person. He was a one-off in life, in sports. In illness, um, he was from Scotland, and he was a hippie. And through uh, a chain of really bizarre events, he wound up running, starting to run. By the time he was thirty, he got into running, and he ran some of the longest races in the world. And he still holds the record for running across Canada. Uh, in 72 days, 10 hours, which is uh, 4,500 miles. And then two weeks later, he was at what was then the longest race in the world, which was a 1,300-mile race around a one-mile loop in Queens, New York. And he runs that race, wins it, breaks his own world record, and he does that in 16 days and 19 hours. So in that span, th this man you know, ran... 5,800 miles in 103 days, an 8-ounce Brooks Kona 
racing flat, you know, uh, triathlon hybrid mashup shoes, ones that you don't want to run that kind of distance in. No gels, no GPS watch, no compression socks, none of the things that they have now that can really help you along. He had water, power bars, and beer. That's what he, he liked. So uh, it, those that's Howie the number, and there's a lot more numbers. It's mind-numbing. Uh, but my but my goal really with the book was to find out uh, what kind of body could take that kind of punishment, what kind of psyche would want to, um, and and then his story, his personal story, became so compelling and became like a mystery novel, uh, trying to kind of uh, you know backtrack from from this running. You know, back to, wait, okay, then how did you get there? How did he get there? And it became a real detective story for me. And uh, it was, yeah. This Did this begin as, as kind of a, a personal curiosity that turned into a hobby um, that then you know a book was born of? Well, it, it's like a, a lot of things that I find um, – in my experience of life, I don't know about other people, but when we were talking a few moments ago about um, kind of realizing your your part of the world or how you interact with the world, for me, it, it, it's one of these instances where things come into your life and they're a part of your life for a while and you don't know their significance or what they mean to you. And then later on, it becomes clear as day, you know, when you look back at it everything you know lines up so for me it all started when i moved to new york i mean that's and to kind of make that a short version is that i was a walking panic attack i'd come from alabama i felt like i'd stepped off on the moon and uh, i didn't know how to deal with it and i was living in a 80 square foot apartment on the upper west side really good neighborhood but a, a tiny little box that could have been 80, my closet 80 square feet 80 square feet. Yeah, my could, my front porch is bigger than that. Well, my closet, I think, was bigger than that in Alabama. That's <laughs> what it right felt up. like. Yeah. One window. A, a, a jail cell on Rikers Island is bigger than right. that. Right. And wow. it has its own bathroom. We had a bathroom in the hallway that I had to share with a couple of uh, people. And so uh, I was in there, and there was a partition. So it was actually supposed to be 160 square foot apartment, right? So they had a partition so that they could have two. And so there was another 80 square foot apartment on the other side. And this guy moves in in 2003 and he, he looked like he came right out of a National Geographic magazine. He had uh, gold teeth, which if you look really close with these little skulls and he smelled like sweat and beer and uh, he just looked like a very dangerous character. But as I was kind of describing it earlier about, you know, coming across similar characters, but not quite like him uh, in Alabama, I was attracted to, to this guy. And I, I thought that there's got to be a story to this guy, how he wound up here. And um, But what happened was I wound up telling my own story, all the anxiety I was going through. And his answer is his answer for everything, which is to run, to exercise, get out there, unplug from all of this stuff. And I listened to him, and we started running miles and miles and miles, and we did that for years, and he became my best friend. So we would run, and uh, then at night we would drink these god-awful Russian beers that he would bring that he got on the cheap. I mean, this guy's never had a bank account, credit card, cell phone. He's as unplugged as it gets. I'm not even sure he's a legal you know, alien you know, of the, of the country. <laughs> he's uh, he's mentioned in the book, but he, he's not he's not mentioned by name. Um, and uh, so I didn't know much about him. I didn't know his last name myself until about I guess after eleven years of knowing him. And then I was researching some of the stories that he had told me about. And one of them was the, one of the stories of these six day races that he had run in Queens. And I started looking those things up, and I found this website Shrishimoy, which is a group that put on these races and I saw this picture and it was him and there was his name first and last and I cut it, copied it, pasted it, Googled it and this huge list came up of these races across America, races across the Sahara Desert 
thousand mile races around Texas, thirteen hundred miles, you know, in in New York, six day races, uh, you, you know, it was twenty four hour bike races around Central Park in the rain, unbelievable things. And I told him, I said, man, you know, this was at the time where I I had already been riding. And um, I said, I want to do your story. I, somebody's got to know about all this stuff. He got really emotional, you know, and uh, he didn't want me to write about him. And he, he walked off from me. And um, But then he came back, and he was really serious. He had turned really serious, and he was drinking. He's always drinking. And he uh, took a big chug of his drink, that he, this metal thermos that he has, you know, that he keeps in his bag. And he said, Al Howie. And he repeated it to me several times. He's like, if you want to write about somebody real, and in his world, when he says something is real, I mean, that's, I, I take note, you know. And uh, so when I looked up Al Howie, not only had Howie done all these races that he had done, but he had done like a thousand more, and he had won almost every one of them. So he wanted me to find this guy. He wanted to see if he was still alive, and he wanted to connect with him. And I did find him, and I connected with him, but he didn't want to connect with my friend. He didn't want to connect with anybody. He was in a home, and he was, uh, he was not doing well. He was not doing well, and he was supposedly there for complications from diabetes, but it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense at all. There was something going on with his mind. And when I found his former wife, she said that's absolutely what was going on, that it was more of a mental thing. But we started a a two-year conversation that we would talk every week or every other week. And, um, yeah, and I that's how the book began. And that's why I titled it In Search of Al Howie, it's because I wanted to know because he was he was another type of my friend, you know. I thought my friend was a, a one-off, but he wasn't. There was somebody else that was like him, and somebody that did want their story told. He made that very clear. He just couldn't tell it very well himself, and so I felt an enormous amount of responsibility to keep pressing and to keep trying to find his story. And uh, it sent me on a journey. It, it's taken five years. Well, like you mentioned earlier, um, this really reads like a mystery novel. Um, I, we know that it's nonfiction. This is a true story. Um, but the narrative thread that you were able to weave through this is fascinating. Um, there are – I mean this this will open your, your mind to an entire world you didn't know existed and, and these people that are, are seemingly superhuman. And But then um, you, know, you peel back more layers and – are they heroes? Are they troubled people? Like, what motivates someone to do this? Not you. You get pa- past the fact, um, you know, that this is possible and that people do this every day. But you know, what possesses a person to do that? It's really fascinating. Um, how how did you find the narrative thread that goes through this? Um, like, as you're having conversations, collecting information, doing research, all of that. Where does that story thread start coming alive? I think that's something that I searched for uh, for a long time in the beginning. Because uh, when I write, I, 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 you know, I'm doing research. I take a lot of notes, and then I usually try to write like a little short story of those notes and just file them away. And then when I start to get into the writing of it. Um, I try to patch them together and see if I can find the narrative or what the narrative is. And it was a struggle in the beginning. And I was struggling with the fact that, one, I think, I I hate to say this, there are some running books that are fantastic, that are extremely well written, but most of them are, are rather boring to me, and I'm a runner. I just think that they come across as encyclopedic and um, and not a, a lot of non-runners can relate to them. And here I am dealing with a guy that's so far beyond what's in all these other running books. I mean, we're talking about somebody that used marathons for speed work. And and so how if I start throwing out numbers at these people, 
uh, I'm just going to help with their insomnia, you know. I'm just going to help them, you know, take a nap. And so, of course, like you had mentioned, his personal life did turn out to be extraordinarily interesting, perplexing, um, and not clear as to who is a hero or who's a villain or if this is heroic or if this is ignorant. Um, but I think that the narrative came clear to me when when I, I realized that I re, where I related to him, and that is that there are so many people that just don't quite fit in anywhere, that maybe you feel like you're a square peg in a round hole, that the world is just not cut out for you, that everybody else seems to be sipping the champagne or or flowing into the conversation of the day and you don't know how to express yourself and you're desperate to find it. And he found it in, in running enormous miles. And when he couldn't do that anymore, he couldn't function. And that's why he was in the home. It was a very steep decline when he could no longer run and break records and live up to this image and idea that he had created and found for himself with how he interacted with the world. And uh, that's what I related to, and that's what I hope that other people can relate to when they read it, that there are so many people, like you were talking about the other runners, they are, they're so wild, the stories, how they get to a thousand mile race. One, how can you take off that much time? Two, right. you know, <laughs> if uh, you don't have a job, you know, uh, how can you deal with the boredom and all that? And they're so eccentric, but in the end, they are people that were just looking for their their way in the world, how to express themselves, how to find somebody that's like them. And that is what I related to, and I, and I felt that that was the narrative that I had to to push and um that i think the i put a quote from hawthorne in the beginning and i thought that that was the question that i wanted the reader to to think about while reading the book because i i i don't know if you're into gladwell or not but i i liked his idea of giving the reader a, a question to ask in the beginning of the article. And so I put this quote from Hawthorne, the greatest obstacle to being heroic is the doubt whether one may not be going to prove oneself a fool. The truest heroism is to resist the doubt and the profoundest wisdom to know when it ought to be resisted and when to be obeyed. And that is true for so so much of us and so much, you know, so so many of us don't face down that question to begin with, I think. And because uh, it, it takes so much bravery, and it takes, and there's so much fear involved in our lives. And but for those that do, and they're outliers, and they they seek seek out some kind of expression for themselves in these races. Uh, I think people, uh, even myself, I, I call them aliens, you know, in the book at some point, and they are in, in so many ways. But in other ways, they're not. They're just like other people who, whether you find it in writing, I mean, writers are not, you know, your average uh, Joe. Most of us are pretty eccentric, you know, and we spend a lot of time obsessing about things that other people don't. You know, we, we think about all these little minutia, you know, of details of whether it be mass murders or incidents or or whether it's you know some the little details of somebody's life or like I was mentioning earlier about somebody that went missing back in the early 80s that they never found and so I think that there's there's something that we can all relate to especially people who don't necessarily fit in sure um I heard someone say one time that uh, a great sports movie is not about the sport but it's about the the journey of, of the characters and you know it, it uses uh you know the sport as a uh, as um a story device um but we don't watch uh, a movie like uh I don't know Rudy or or something like that to learn how to be a great college football player we 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 want to follow along with this 
character's journey and hopefully learn something about ourselves in the way uh, along the way. And uh, in search of Al Howie is that kind of book that uh, there, there's a lot of superhuman stuff that goes in here that that's fascinating uh, on, on, on a level, but the, the character study is more fascinating to me. And, you know, it made me, it made me ask questions about, you know, the reason that, that I do things. And uh, I think that's what a great uh, story does is it helps us to see, uh, ourselves and other people. I, I think you nailed it. That is exactly, I think, what we've been talking about this whole time. <laughs> That's exactly it. And um, a lot of people love their sports, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can just enjoy it, watch it, be a fan. Uh, I'm a fan of several sports myself. But stories like uh, Tony Kurtz, you know, in his attempt to try to climb. Uh, you know, the Iger, and then his death, and then how that happened. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but his struggle to to survive, which he didn't, but, but the fact that he gave it everything that he had, he gave absolutely everything that he had to survive is what's compelling about it. Or Bob Beeman, you know, his jump, you know, when he jumped 29 feet, I think it was, in the long jump. I, somebody has surpassed him now, and I'm sure people that, that follow track and field would, would remember. But a lot of us remember Bob Beeman that don't know anything about track and field. And it's because he, he jumped two feet further than anybody had ever jumped before. They didn't even have measuring equipment. He, he jumped past the measuring equipment. And when he realized what he did, he collapsed. In that moment, to me, is transcendent. It goes beyond the sport itself. And whether it's Tony Kurtz or Bob Beeman or Jim Ryan or, or whoever or Al Howie, it, 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 it's something that, that just goes beyond the sport of what they're doing or taking part in. I, I think you really nailed it there. Well, the new book is called In Search of Al Howie. Uh, Jared, this is such a phenomenal book. I'm telling everyone about it. Uh, there's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Uh, if people are just learning about you and want to plug into all the stuff that you do, is there a place they can connect with you online? There is. Uh, JaredBeasleyNY.com. I've got a page dedicated to uh, Howie, to uh, Tom McGrath, the first book that I did, and this third book that I'm working on now. And there's also some other stories that I'm interested in and have been working on that may be way down the road. But there are things that they can find there. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of the book. Uh, Jared, this has been so much fun talking. Thank you for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run, but now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge. A shape of some sort. He stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids 
flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Cranes, Jason Cranes, Jason Cranes. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bane, Ekdal, Forest, Black, Small. There. He saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay, just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. Some Halloween thing, maybe, for some event. He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider, standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless? 